the Hall Finch or the Gulvin Braff, as it is known in Welsh. Um, surprisingly, for such a large finch, the biggest finch we've got in the UK, it's quite a scarce bird. Though is that scarcity due to the fact that not many people see them? Um, despite their bright colours, if they stand quietly in the top of a tree, they are very difficult to see. Anyway, being the BTO, uh, there's no doubt about it. I've got to show you maps and things, and some of these maps have all been generated by data that has been collected by ourselves over the years. If we go back to the original breeding bird atlas, 6872, you'll see that the whole finch is predominantly a bird of the southeast. Um, few colonies on the Welsh border down in the one month. And a few little dots appear in North Wales, and one in Ceredigion, and one across near Llanelli. Um, I remember as a child being taken into Penryn Castle by the Talabont entrance by Jack the Old Woodman, and shown some hoar finches then. And then I never saw them for 40 years afterwards, so that's how difficult they were to see, and despite being quite local to us here in North Wales. Second necklace we did some years afterwards. Um, as you'll see, the distribution has contracted still the strong, strongest down here in the southeast. Um, here we are, Gwent, Y Forest of Dean, Y Forest is getting a little bit stronger, and a few rec records again scattered across here in northwest Wales. The last atlas, big, big contraction, practically disappeared from the southeast of, where, of England. Um, we've got here down in Gwent a good population, a few more appear in Gwynedd, and a discrete population appear in Silverdale. So something's going on. Like lots of species, climate change, changing environments are affecting these birds and their range is contracting and moving. Um, the beauty of all this data, we can do simple to understand little maps like this one. So if you look at this, is the changes between the original atlas done 6872 and the last one. You can see all these down arrows where it's disappeared from, but they've gone up again, Gwent, Forest of Dean, My Forest, and in South Gwynedd. So something's going on. So whole finches, notoriously difficult to study. Um, they're not easy to catch, uh, very shy birds. Um, you talk to friends who have been in the services in Germany who used to do bird ringing and they quite happily come to gardens in Germany. Uh, in this country, they're very scarce in gardens. Um, they're very difficult to catch. Nobody's had a lot of success uh, catching them over the years. But there we are. And the last and most important thing in studying hawfinches, they do bite. Now, if anybody wants to know how they bite, come and see me when we can catch up again and I've got a pair of needle nose pliers and I will get hold of your finger with them and I will squeeze and I will not let go and I will have a demonic glint in my eye like the Corfinch has got. So being the BTO I am good with graphs. So when I originally put this together I went through all the online ringing records and I created a graph of the number of Horfinches since the ringing scheme started and interestingly uh, as you can see a lot more work has been going on the last few years, and in the early years, not much going on. So let's have a look at what's going on. So mist nets were introduced about 1956. So prior to mist nets, they were either caught in walk-in traps at observatories, done as pullers in nests, or fluke catches somewhere else. So as soon as mist nets came in, there was a surge in catching these birds, or a small surge, but again, never great numbers caught in a year going on. Uh, then Mr. Jerry Lewis from down in Gwent stepped into the picture. Uh, Jerry had always caught a few in the forest of Dean down by Forest, and he was adamant that there must be easier ways of catching them, or there must be a standardised, simple way of catching them that makes life easy for everybody. So Jerry worked out that if you pre bait them, they will come to bait on the ground. But it seems that they were more likely to come to bait February, March, April, and possibly into May when the natural wild food has gone. They will come to the bait and then you can catch them. 
So Jerry tried a number of techniques down there, um, mist netting them, a whoosh net, which is a catapult fired net. And Jerry found the most successful way they found down there was to put the nets where the bird to the bushes where the birds had flushed to once they came off the ground having dropped down. There we go. So there we are. So Jerry pioneered his catching techniques 2002. He wrote a number of articles for the ringers across the UK who adopted his techniques, whereupon we started to catch an awful lot more of them. Jerry's technique obviously worked, and it's the technique that we tend to use in the Conway Valley and down at Olgetlad. Now, is a copy of one of Jerry's articles. If somebody wants a copy of it, let me know, and I can send you a PDF of it. And then Dolgetlai started in 2010. Now, there'd always been a few birds seen around Dolgetlai. Uh, we knew there were a few in Llanelli Churchyard, but we'd had a few goals at catching them without lots of success. Dave Smith, who now works for RSPB, lives in Dolgetlai and Llanelli now, I think. And he was really keen to know an awful lot more about the birds in Dolgetlai. Um, initially, he thought there was about 30 odd birds in Dolgetlai. Uh, I think that first year we proved there was an awful lot more. And of course, quick look at the North Wales Breeding Bird Atlas, which again was done by your old data, and it proves that yes, the hotspot is down here in Dolgetlai area. Few we mind Turog, but colouring has proved there's a big interaction between them. A few up the valley from Dolgetlai towards Bala. Conway Valley, not the numbers you've got in Dolgetlai, but reasonable sized flocks are seen up there. And there's a discrete little colony up near Ruthin Way, which comes up and down depending on the weather and all sorts of stuff. So, Dolgetlai Church, or well, Llanethnid Churchyard, where all the ringing started. Um, Dave Smith at one point was employed by RSBB at the Malbach Valley and he was late for work one day and Reg Thorpe asked him, where you been Dave? He says, oh, I've been counting the hawfinches. To which Reg, for those who you know Reg, looked at Dave with a bit of a dirty look, what hawfinches? Uh, Reg being the warden of the what, reserve that they had at Bont there, had recorded one or two hawfinches. Then when Dave told him he was regularly getting these hawfinches coming into Llanelli Churchyard and then disappearing to roost at the back of the val village, uh, to say he was a bit niff, it was a, a bit of an understatement. But this is the place to see them at that point. The catching started. Here's Dave. You may recognise him. Not sure who this bloke next to him is, but uh, we won't mention him. And here's the target bird. Now, for those of you who are aware of the BTO, we've got a policy for social media that you don't show poor pictures. And really, I shouldn't really show you this picture because it's not a brilliant picture of the hawfinch. Plus, there's blood. But the reason I show you this picture is because the blood is mine. And it was not there before I took this bird out of the bird bag. Um, I did have a small nick on the edge of one of my fingers, which he promptly got hold of, reopened and wouldn't let go. But I think what I really like about this photograph is look at the colour of that bill. If you see them in midwinter, they've got a pale ivory bill. As the breeding season comes on into April and into May, the bill takes this beautiful steel blue colour. So there we are. So like I said, if you want to feel how powerful that beak is, they can crush cherry stones. So there's a lot of pressure in there. It's a massive skull if you've ever seen one. I have got a pair of pliers. I will get hold of your finger and I will squeeze until you scream. So the perceived literature always told us simply, oh, they're not the easiest things to sex. So quiz, what sex do you think this one is? And what sex do you think that one is? Um, once, like lots of birds, once you get familiar with the species, get to see them regularly, these things become quite easy. In the days when people saw the odd one or two whole finches, you didn't quite get your eye in. So just to make sure, bright colourful thing here with the beak, not quite getting as blue as the first bird, so, it's, so probably February-ish, and the female browner. There we are. Um, I mentioned earlier that in Germany and places, they do get them in gardens. So one thing about the study in Dolgesheim was that we were colouring the birds. Oh, well, I helped out on it, but Tony Cross and Dave Smith were colouring in most of the birds. And 
gentleman got in touch with the office that he was getting these colouring birds in the garden and wondered where they'd escaped from. Um, chap lives at the back, or well, used to live at the back of the police station in Dolgetla, and he sent me some photographs. And wow, great, here we go. And here we are, colouring hawfinches. Um, Trevor, whose garden it was, got involved in this project. Um, he would photograph and record the hawfinches. And in his best year, he recorded 1,300 sightings of hawfinch in his back garden out of the kitchen window, of which 87 were individually coloring. So there we are. Um, as the years have come on, a number of other people have started getting them into their gardens. So I'm wondering, as we are getting several generations down the line, are they getting quite used to coming into gardens? And we were going to see more of them in the gardens in Dolgetla. Because there's a number of other dog gardens in Dolgetla today who report colourings, as well as people in San Festinog and Rid Sarn at the bottom of the hill there. My Turog have seen them. And there's a lady in Bond that gets quite a few of these birds. Uh, the beauty of these rings are they're not particularly intrusive, but you can read them quite easily with binoculars. And if you've got a camera, they photograph quite nicely. In the hand, you weigh them, age them, sex them, and the rest of it. And as you notice, they still hang on. So you look at it, you've got these lovely, glossy, weird looking shape here to the feather. Quite a stonking sized bird. Uh, the amount of gloss helps you with aging the bird. Uh, the contrast between the primary coverts and the greater coverts here is visible, but some of these thumbs in the way, usually the shape of the tail tells you how old they are. Um, here's a shot of the closed wing and you can see these beautiful sails and a big square shape. This is an adult bird. Um, somewhere in the past I have seen a book. It's not the Montford monograph. It's not BWP. It's not Witherby where there were a series of draw line drawings of hawfinches displaying. And in one of these line drawings they were putting the wings up and using these, um, I don't know what you're going to call them, waves as part of the display. Um, I have been through every book imaginable and I've asked how many people and I still can't find that reference or those drawings which I'd love to get a copy of. If somebody's aware of it, can you let me know? It would be great. So part of the book, or Svensson as it was then, which is the Ringer's Bible, says they're not easiest things to age in the world. Well, here's one tail feather and there's another tail of a different bird. Notice this is the weighing pot. You can look at the tail of the bird in the weighing pot and they've got no way can they bite you, which is great. So this is an adult bird, clean white patches, square tail. A juvenile bird, relatively pointed tail, not square and round, and this dirty gray color. So. As we caught more and more of them, or as the team caught more and more of them, we got more extremely proficient at aging and sexing these birds. Now, back to catching them and the slight downside. This is Rachel. Her husband works for the BTO. He's from Llangothan Lee. And they were up visiting the in-laws one time. They happened to speak to Tony, whom they know quite well. So said, oh, come give us a hand. And here's Rachel uh, in the days when we used to use mitts nets in the wood to catch them. And Rachel being very polite, Ooh, this hurts. Here's Tony when one got hold of his finger. Uh, those of you who know Tony, um, he did not go, ooh, this hurts. There were a few beep, 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 beeps going on there here. But, you know, they do hurt. Um, they will get hold of you and they hang on and they don't care. And they easily give you blood blisters if they don't actually draw blood, if they get you somewhere really tender. So this is a big problem with handling them. Um, there are several techniques in ringing. Uh, there's lots of proper ways of doing things and one or two ways that you don't do things. Uh, one thing that you do not do with hawfinch is when you are given a bird bag to process, you do not put your hand straight in the bag or they will get hold of you. You very gently work out from outside the bag where the head of the bird is, gently put it in the ringer's grip from outside the bag, then slip your hand in the bag and put the bird in the ringer's grip. That way it does not get hold of you. So here's our few, just a few birds on the ground in the wood near Dolgetla. 
where lots of this went on. Um, a couple of siskins. You can see it's black sunflower, and this is what's known as a wushnet. It's laid on the floor. There's bungee elastic on each corner, and you work out with sort of discrete little markers, uh, stones put on edge or whatever, so you know what the catching area is. So when the birds are on the ground where you want them, you pull a string from a distance, and the net is then thrown over them, and out they come. Um, it's a lot easier than mist nets. The problem with mist nets is that whole finches tend to drop straight down from the trees. So when they flush, they go straight back up, not going sideways into the nets. So this became a very efficient way of catching them. Um, RSPB were doing a lot of work on whole finch at the same time down in England. Um, they are a scarce species. We know very little about them. They're quite secretive, despite all the work the guy Montford did on them. Still don't know a lot. So they got in touch and got involved and some little radio tags which are glued onto the rump were added to a few birds to see if we can get local history what was going on with them. <coughs> so these were put on and the birds were tracked with little aerials and nests were found. Um, over the years Dave's found a few nests but not an awful lot considering how many birds are down there. So once you've found a nest you can put a little camera on and there's a view of this little nest, not the tidiest little nest ever in the world. But once you've got the, the pictures and a camera on, you can see what's going on at the nest. Um, let's go back for a second. Interestingly, the greatest predator that we've got, or seemingly got, for hawfinches are jays. Um, squirrels leave them well alone. Even on the ground, squirrels leave them alone. So what did we find? The literature tells us that they nest in big trees on outer branches. They were found on the forest freed edge, as you can see here. Interesting, you thought, but it's lots of old growth, lots of insects. For, like lots of finches, they do eat a lot of insects when they're rearing chicks, probably back to being fully vegetarian come winter. Um, here's a typical tree you might think of. Um, I must stress that Tony has done all formal health and safety courses about using ladders. The fact he totally disregards them is nothing to do with it, but there we are. And here's our beauties. So here we are in the nest. Even at an early age, you can see that beak coming. A couple of weeks afterwards, or a couple of days afterwards in this case, um, that lovely fluorescence in there, which I take it in the dark forest or the overcast forest, is ideal for parents to know where the mouths are so they can shovel the food in to get that wonderful growth. And here's one of our babies. Um, look a bit gawky, but give him a couple of weeks. And here we are, fledged out the nest, caught in Trevor's garden some weeks afterwards. Again, second or third generation getting used to coming into gardens so hopefully we will see more and more of this so what we learned from all this ringing there's a big population in the Dogetla area a lot more than initially thought um, surprisingly there is a migration across into Scandinavia Jerry had the original birds went into southern Norway down here Tony had a couple of birds a bird turn up here so interesting why is nobody picking them up on the route? Um, here's one of the Conway Valley birds that was found out in ooh, somewhere else. That's one of Tony's again. I was up here. Uh, the Conway Valley bird, like you saw, was photographed in the garden and the data came across to us. So, would that be Sweden? I'm not sure of my or just northern Norway. Um, interestingly, a female that Tony ringed in May was taken out of a tawny owl box in June. So they're quite late migrants and off they go. OK, if you're on Spurn and such places on the East Coast, you will see them in autumn, but nobody seems to see them with the colourings coming through. But there's obvious this big migration. Um, if you've ever done bird ringing, you will soon get a feel for birds. And when you've handled a few hawfinches, you get sort of a feel for the weight of them. Surprisingly, one or two of these migrants, um, you're catching them in April and in May, you take them out the net and they feel big. You can gently blow on the catracheal pit at the throat and you can see they've laid down flat fat. 
they're slightly bigger and they're a lot heavier so you can pick them up that way so how big this migration in is we don't know but it exists um so problem slight problem we did have at one point was that we suspect that trichnomiosis the disease which has wiped out most of our green finches had jumped into whole finches when you think about it they feed much the same way as green finches so what do we do about it well first thing we had to make sure everybody in dog gets out stop feeding if you've got trick in your area you can do something about it dead easy you stop feeding for a minimum of three weeks per month you disinfect all your feeders and that way you break the cycle but everybody locally has got to do this there's no point one person doing it everybody has so julian hughes rspb ran an article in the daily post on it we ran it on radio wales news we got involved with dogs like facebook uh, get a local paper the Cambrian news where a few people knocking doors and everybody fair play to them in all get like stop feeding for a month disinfected and we broke the cycle it can be done but like i said it's quite labor intensive in making sure that everybody gets involved in it and does it so i think one thing that was quite important was that we were quite brutal with people in the message we put across um, we told them simply if you carry on feeding these birds and doesn't matter how much you love them and enjoy seeing them if you keep feeding them you will be killing them and you know one or two little old ladies yeah but they like coming here for their breakfast in the morning well yes but if you want to carry on you will be killing them and that's you had to be brutal and that's how the message got across um initially when i did this talk for the welsh ornithological society some years back we were doing a lot of tweeting on this and an ardent bird feeder from somewhere at this point chirped up to say that it was nothing to do with people feeding birds in the gardens trick it was to do with people catching them and putting rings on them and she put a few photographs of her feeding stations which were vast and there was poo and shells everywhere and hygiene wise it was a mess so the secret is you've got to keep your feeding stations clean and hygienic if your birds are your number one interest and their welfare does come first so um how far do they go locally well here's one of the dog get like birds that turned up in a garden in near clan again you see dead easy to see with the rings on here's a male no ring um interestingly if they want to take the plastic rings off they will take the plastic rings off um, one male I'm aware of in Dolgetha had a ring fitted in the morning. He was caught again mid morning and he'd taken it off. The ring was put on again with a little bit of glue to fix it. And he was caught again later on that afternoon and he'd taken that ring off as well. So if they want to take them off, they will take them off. The steel rings, they can't take off. So they're there forever. But um, with a little bit of jiggling and blowing up in various programs we can enlarge that ring and work out from elimination which bird it was and to finish here's a beautiful back shot so if you were a ringer you would be thinking right it's a male big broad tail he's an adult look at these beautiful colors here and when you think that is a male hand how big that bird is um, sorry I can't be here in person to answer any questions but if you want to get in touch with me it's kelvin.jones at bto.org and my phone number is available on the website if you want to talk all finches give me a ring thank you very much